American evacuation flights from Afghanistan are in their final hours ahead of the withdrawal deadline. Rockets have been fired towards Kabul airport. IS militants have claimed responsibility. The U.S. is facing questions over a drone strike in Kabul as eyewitnesses say civilians, including children, were killed. Uh, we lost 10 persons, including my daughter. She was at uh, two years old. She was two years old. The Pentagon says it is investigating. Also on the program... Oh, my God! Yo, yo! Warnings of life-threatening floods in the southern United States as Hurricane Ida hits. And in Tokyo, Great Britain's Lee Pearson wins another gold, the 14th of his career. Good evening. The United States says it is confident that the withdrawal of the last troops from Afghanistan will be completed before tomorrow's deadline. Rockets have been fired towards Kabul airport today with the Islamic State group claiming responsibility. And the Pentagon says it's investigating accounts that a U.S. drone strike in Kabul, which it says was targeting an imminent IS attack, has killed 10 civilians, including children. Sikandar Kirmani reports from Kabul. Flames leap from a car after militants from the Islamic State group used it to launch rockets at Kabul airport. They were intercepted by a missile defense system. But planes landing today fired flares to try and protect themselves from further attack. Nearby, a family combs through the wreckage of a US drone strike launched yesterday. Relatives and neighbours are collecting remains of the victims to bury. They angrily reject American claims the vehicle targeted was being used by a suicide bomber from the Islamic State group. If there was a bomb inside, the car would have been blown up, says this man. Amongst those killed, two-year-old Samaya, 12-year-old Farzad and these two twins as well as Nasser, who had previously worked alongside American forces. The family was hoping to be evacuated out of the country. Well, my brother came from his work, want to park in the car in here, and uh, they their children. It was in the car uh, on, the, on that time that uh, happened in Okra. And how, how many people from your family ten died? Ten persons died in here. We lost ten persons, including my daughter. He was at... Uh, Two years old. What happened here appears to be an awful human tragedy. It also underlines the challenges the US is going to face in trying to target militants from afar and the terrible consequences ordinary Afghans have to pay. The US has said it's assessing and investigating reports of civilian casualties but insists an imminent threat to the airport was disrupted. Nobody wants to see innocent life taken. Uh, we take it very, very seriously. And, uh, and when we know that we have caused innocent life to be lost in the conduct of our operations, we're transparent about it. Uh, we're investigating this. I'm not going to get ahead of it. The evacuation effort is now in its very final stages, with U.S. soldiers being flown out ahead of Tuesday's withdrawal deadline. Many Afghans remain desperate to leave the country. At this bus stand in Kabul, many are headed for the Iranian border. Nearly all are hoping to be smuggled across. Passenger numbers have more than doubled in recent weeks. The previous government only cared about getting rich themselves, says this man. Now the Taliban are here. There are no jobs. There's no work anywhere. I need to be able to feed my kids. Everything has become more expensive. We can't live here anymore. A new era in Afghanistan is about to begin. The Taliban say they're bringing peace and ending corruption. But for those here, the deep uncertainty that has accompanied their arrival is a final push towards a new life. Sikandar Kamani, BBC News, Kabul. Well, also in Kabul is our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette. Lise, international meetings have been taking place today, the G7, the UN. What is the aim as the withdrawal deadline nears? 
Michelle, they really are stripping it down to bare bones after what was a massive 20 year international engagement with lofty goals to transform this country. What they're talking about in a draft resolution is two main things, and they're still important. One is to ensure that all of those Afghans who have the right, they have the right documents and the desire, the, the absolute fear about staying in Afghanistan, who want to leave, they should be given safe passage. They want Taliban guarantees for that, even though the military evacuations have all but ended. They also want uh, you know, the, new, the Taliban to commit themselves to ensuring that Afghanistan doesn't become a base for terrorism again. But we also heard from the, the Secretary of State, the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Robb, talking about the international community using its pressure to exert a moderating influence on the Taliban. Well, what does that mean? And what does he mean by the international community? Some of the first acts that the Taliban did was to remove what they describe as Western values, Western concepts of right. Young men and women study at universities, women taking certain roles in the civil service. And when you talk about the international community, who do you mean? Neighbors, near neighbors like Pakistan, China, Russia, their main concern is going to be security, stability, and perhaps they will make some progress with the Taliban on that and Western powers will also want that and so I think going forward the Taliban leaders won they feel they won convincingly over the world's mightiest army their overriding goal is to establish an Islamic Emirate they have been a government in waiting for many months and they know that their neighbors and near neighbors have more interest in working with them than setting up the kind of conditions the Taliban won't and aren't aren't able or willing to meet. Thank you. There's a warning of life-threatening flooding in the southern United States as Hurricane Ida moves from Louisiana into Mississippi. It brought winds of 150 miles an hour as it made landfall yesterday, ripping roofs off buildings. One man was killed when a falling tree hit his house. Flash floods have already affected residents of New Orleans, despite defences being strengthened after Hurricane Katrina 16 years ago. Our correspondent Neda Tofik is in New Orleans. Hurricane Ida has left a trail of wreckage and destruction. Hundreds of crews are currently working to rescue people trapped by the flooding in low-lying areas. And almost this entire region is without power and water. This promised to be a historic hurricane. Well, it's certainly one that people here will not soon forget. This was the force of Ida's winds as it mercilessly pounded Louisiana with water. A hospital building filled with patients in the town of Cutoff yo, yo. was no match for the storm's fury. Part of the roof was lifted off with ease by the gusts. Low-lying areas were overwhelmed by the tidal surge. This footage from a fire station in Delacroix, Louisiana, captured the dramatic rush of water as the night wore on. In New Orleans, the entire city went dark as the storm raged outside and a transmission tower toppled into the Mississippi River. At this hotel, workers struggled to get their generator running. All across southern Louisiana, the painful task of surveying the damage from Hurricane Ida is underway. The destruction is immense and the situation for some is desperate. In Jefferson Parish, emergency services have received at least 200 rescue calls since last night. There, the rising waters and intense winds left communities in tatters. Clarence has lived here for 50 years and says this is the worst storm he's lived through. It's, it's terrifying. I mean, we're in the bedroom and start leaking and then we come out the bedroom and go into another room and start leaking in that room. And then finally we came into the living room and the dining room here. And this was the only room where it didn't really leak. It leaked, but it didn't leak that bad where the sheetrock fell in. Without proper shelter, power, or water, he has no choice but to leave. His dilemma now, where to go? Hurricane Ida strengthened so rapidly that it gave people here very little time to prepare or evacuate. For those who stayed, the night was scary, but seeing the fallout the morning after has been even harder. Along the roadways, closed and impassable in many areas, we found this family walking to find food. The storm's strong winds ripped their trailer apart in the middle of the night. They took shelter at a neighbor's house. I ain't got nothing left. House is gone, car is gone. 
sorry. Emergency crews are now focused on rescue operations. The next step recovery will be long and difficult. Neda Taufik, BBC News, New Orleans. Let's turn to the latest UK coronavirus figures, which show that there were 26,476 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means an average of more than 33,500 cases per day in the last week. Another 48 deaths have been recorded, and that takes the average number of deaths per day over the last week to 115. On vaccinations, more than 88% of adults have now had their first jab, and 78.6% have had both doses. Within those figures, the latest Scottish data shows another 3,893 cases. Infections have almost doubled every week since restrictions eased. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, had been self-isolating after being identified as a close contact of a positive case. Her PCR test has now come back as negative, which means that under the rules for those who are double vaccinated, she no longer has to isolate. Regulators in China have imposed restrictions on online gaming, limiting under-18s to three hours of play a week. It comes amid concern about addiction and the physical and mental health of young people. Companies have been told to ensure under-18s game only between 8 and 9 p.m. on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays and public holidays. The legal system in England and Wales needs major change and a technological transformation to save time and money. That's the call from a senior judge, Sir Geoffrey Voss, who says justice needs to be more easily accessed and some processes and disputes could be handled online. Chloe Haywood reports. We need to create a justice system that is accessible by real people. To say that justice has to be done by taking a pile of papers down to the local county court and asking somebody to stamp them, that is not any longer necessary. The traditional legal system headed by judges has been almost immune to technological innovation. But now the head of the civil judiciary, Sir Geoffrey Voss, wants machines to do some of the work of the lawyers. It's time to make some serious changes. Admittedly, I may be a little ahead of the game, but we need to create a justice system that is accessible. We need to put it online and we need to make it speedy and effective. With such grand ambitions, his first focus is on creating a better system for payment disputes. Ronnie runs a construction company with 20 employees. But like so many small businesses, she wastes thousands of pounds a year chasing payments. 40% of her clients do not pay on time. Probably 5 to 10% of our invoices may not be paid at all. It's significant. We've worked really hard, we've delivered on the service, we've delivered on our promise, and we've not been paid for the work. So it is demoralising, really. I want better legal support that is cost-effective, quick and fit for purpose. And this is exactly what the government-backed initiative Law Tech UK hopes to create, a new portal that will log all disputes. The majority will then be settled online via artificial intelligence and only a few will eventually be funnelled into the traditional court setting. eBay uses a similar model to settle over 60 million small disputes each year already. This is definitely just the beginning. The technology is absolutely there to be used within the legal system to make it better for everyone, to make it really easy, to take all the friction away. And we should be using it. We should be using it to help people, to help businesses. The potential in the law tech sector is clearly huge, but there are concerns. Digital exclusion is one of them, whether from a skills perspective or physical access to the internet. And there's concerns around data protection as well. But perhaps the biggest pushback comes from lawyers themselves. Some are concerned that moving online will water down the humane side of justice. But the master of the roles really does believe that the majority of law can be done by computers rather than lawyers. The idea that it's not going to happen is fanciful. If I was going to go and buy a house in 20 years' time, what should my experience be like? I think that the purchase of property will be recorded on the blockchain and it's entirely possible that the contract will be digitally undertaken. For Ronnie, accessible legal support would be a welcome help, she says, as long as it works and can be enforced. Chloe Hayward, BBC News.
In Tokyo, Johnny Peacock has won a bronze medal in his 100-metre sprint final after being Paralympic champion for the last two games. Elsewhere, there have been three more goals for Great Britain for wheelchair racer Andrew Small, archer Phoebe Patterson-Pine and for Sir Lee Pearson in dressage. He is the third most successful British Paralympian ever. From Tokyo, here's Andy Swiss. He couldn't do it again, could he? Johnny Peacock chasing a Paralympic hat-trick. Peacock has struggled with injury since the last games, but he roared out of the blocks. The rest were closing in, though, and the result was one of the most thrilling races in Paralympic history. Felix Streng, I think. Gold for Germany's Felix Streng, but just look how tight it was. The first four within three hundredths of a second. Had Peacock got a medal? Well, a photo couldn't separate him and Johannes Flaws, so the pair shared the bronze. Peacock later said he probably should have won it, but in defeat, he contributed to a dazzling spectacle. Well, what a dramatic night we've had here in Tokyo. But while Johnny Peacock's reign might be over, earlier on, Britain found a new 100 metre star. Andrew Small took up athletics after watching the London Paralympics. Now the man inspired by 2012, was victorious in 2021. Small gets it. For Small, who had to train in his garage during lockdown, the pride was plain. But it was nothing to that back at his family home. His dad, Steve, pushing every inch of the way. And come the finish, this is what it meant. Yeah, um, my family are my biggest boys. They're through thick and thin. They see a lot of, I mean, they see its ups and downs. There was a lot of long, hard sessions in, in a cold, dark garage at night. But, you know, the combination of that is here. And other British athletes had gold in their sights. In the archery, Phoebe Patterson Pine taking the title by a single point, the tiniest possible margin for the biggest possible prize. But most remarkably of all, there was another gold for Sir Lee Pearson. On Breezer, the horse he'd bred at his home in Staffordshire, his third title here and his 14th in total, another glittering games for one of British sports most glittering stars. Andy Swiss, BBC News, Tokyo. This more throughout the evening on the BBC News Channel. We're back with the late news at 10. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news wherever you are. Goodbye.